Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, today we have Kony Zhang from Stanford. Uh, he's doing a postdoc with Sachin Kati. Uh, and he did his PhD at UMass and first with Deepak Ganesan. Um, so his research focuses on designing and implementing low power communications, sensing, and computing systems for the Internet of Things. He uh, received the SIG Mobile Dissertation Award. And his paper is nominated for Best Paper Awards and Movies as Census Eva Convent. So let's give a warm welcome to him. Thanks, Justin, uh, for the introduction. I'm Peng Yu. Uh, today I will talk about our research on building low power uh, communication sensing and computation system for IoTs. Um, in recent years, we have seen a massive number of IoT devices fabricated and shipped to the market. And we can see that last year, the number of the IoT devices is larger than the combined market of the PC, smartphone, and tablet. And the vision here is that we are going to see a world where IoT devices are widely deployed in the next several years. However, we think that this vision is limited by research problems in three domains. One is the wireless connectivity, and one is the energy efficient computing, and one is the data analytics for IoT devices. We do research on the boundary of these three areas, and today I will focus on talking about our research progress on two areas. First, let's look at why, uh, uh, how to provide low power wireless connections for IoT devices. So why do we need wireless low power connection for IoTs? In this figure, we show the power consumption comparison between IoT devices versus other modes in an embedded system. We can see that even the most power efficient radio, the Bluetooth low energy here, it can seem four orders of magnitude more power compared to a simple accelerometer sensor, two orders of magnitude more power compared to the microcontroller, and five times more power compared to the storage unit SRAM. As a result, the wireless radio has become the bottleneck of running the embedded system. Ideally, we want to have something some wireless radio that, is, can, that can seem hundreds of microwatts of power, if we have, can have such radio, we are able to run a system for a long time, and in some cases, we perhaps we don't need a battery to run the embedded system. So that's our goal here, how to design such radio. To answer this question, let's look at why the wireless radio can seem lots of power. The fundamental reason here is that when a wireless radio transmits its data, it has to be the device which generates the signal. If the wireless radio generates a signal to transfer the information, it introduces two power-hungry components. One is a complicated digital baseband processing, which generates the data that you want to transfer. The second part is about very power-hungry RF and log circuits. Both are power-hungry. So if you generate the signal, then you have to run both components. Both are power-hungry. That's the fundamental reason why a wireless radio that you have today can seem lots of power for communicating the data. So the question we'll ask here is, that, is it possible for us to transfer the data over the wireless channel without running very complicated baseband processing, without using power-hungry RF circuits? Well, this is not new. We learned something from the RFID design. In the RFID system, we have an RFID reader which provides you a continuous care wave. This continuous care wave is converted into energy and stored in the local buffer by the RFID tag. The RFID tag reflects the carry wave back to the RFID reader. During the signal reflection, it, it modulates its, data, its information on top of the reflected signal. 
So if you look at the, uh, how the RFID tag transmits the information, the tag does not generate a signal. It reflects the signal for data communication. As a result, an RFID tag only consumes several microwatts for communicating its data. It does not need a battery for operation. So it seems that RFID is great, right? I can transfer the data at microwatts. I don't need a battery for operation. But why don't we see the RFID-ish communication system widely used around us? We're using Wi-Fi, right? We're not using RFID for accessing the network. Why is this case? The fundamental reason here is that when the RFID operates, it relies on the RFID reader infrastructure. So if you want to use RFID, for example, in a Walmart or in a Target, you see the RFID reader deployed there. If we want to use RFID infrastructure in this building, we have to redeploy the RFID reader infrastructure in this building. The overhead of deploying, redeploying the infrastructure is really high. So the question here is, we want to ask answer in this talk here, is that is it possible for us to leverage existing infrastructure such as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to enable such RFID-ish low power data communication. And our key contribution here is that we build a practical system that is able to do the data communication on top of the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and Zigbee traffic. In our system, we have a transmitter. The transmitter can be the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or Zigbee. The transmitter transmits some packets. This packet is reflected by the special device we designed here to the receiver. During the signal reflection, our particular device here is able to inject its own data on top of the reflected packets. More importantly, the reflected packets is still a valid packet that is able to be received by the commercial receiver. The only difference is that this packet is modified by the special device here. So because this special device here injects its data on the existing wireless traffic, so it does not require lots of power for communicating its information. And here is a demo of our system. In this system, we have a Wi-Fi transmitter here, which transmits continuous Wi-Fi packets. We have a Wi-Fi receiver here, which is my laptop here. And we have a special device in the middle. This special device we call RFID, we call a backseller tag here, is connected to ECG sensor. And this special device reflects the Wi-Fi packets from the transmitter to the receiver. During the signal reflection, it injects the ECG sensor data on the reflected signal. And the receiver receives the reflected packets decode the packets, extract the ECG sensor data, and display the ECG sensor data in real time. So how do we build such a such system? You can see that in our system, both the transmitter and the Wi-Fi receiver are commercial device. We do not require any hardware modification. And the Wi-Fi transmitter can transmit arbitrary Wi-Fi packets. How do we inject that, the ECG sensor data on top of such packets? We have to address several challenges here. The first the challenge we address here is that how do we inject and decode the tag information on top of unknown uh, wireless traffic? The wireless radio can be transmitting arbitrary data, but the tag we design injects its own information on top of such unknown traffic. So in order to understand that, let's look at concrete example. Let's look at how the Wi-Fi works. In the Wi-Fi system, when the Wi-Fi transmitter transmitted data to the receiver, it does not directly transmit data 0 and data 1 directly. Instead of transmitting data 0 and data 1, it's transmitting corresponding code words. For example, in this example here, when the Wi-Fi radio transmits data 0, it transmits the blue code word here. And when it transmits data 1, it transmits the red code word here. Once the corresponding code word is chosen, then the signal on the physical layer is produced and sent to the Wi-Fi receiver. The key observation here is that a Wi-Fi 
only use a fixed number of the code words for transmitting its own information. More importantly, we found that we can convert, we can transform one code word to another code word by performing some simple operation. Let's look at this example here. We want to convert the red code word to the blue code word. So what's the difference here? If you look at these two code words here, you can find that we can actually multiply the red code word by minus one and convert it into the blue code word. Similarly, we can convert the blue code word to the red code word by multiplying minus one. So if the conclusion, the, the take home message here is that for the many of the wireless communication system, we can do such uh, code word conversion by performing some simple operations. So the question here is that how do we leverage this operation to encode the tag data on the Wi-Fi existing wireless traffic? In our system, if the tag wants to transmit the data zero, it directly reflects the code word from the transmitter to the receiver without performing any transformation. The reflected code word here is exactly the same as the code word that is used by the Wi-Fi transmitter. So, so is it actually reflecting or is it simply doing nothing? It's doing the channel shifting, moving the signal, the backstage signal into another channel. We will cover this part uh, later. So that if the tag wants to transmit it to zero, it does not modify the reflected code word. If the tag wants to transmit it to one, it will do the code word transformation. The reflected code word here will be slightly different compared to the incoming code word that is used by the Wi-Fi transmitter. How does the tag know the bit boundaries? Wi-Fi is some weird thing. Tag cannot really decode Wi-Fi, so how do you know the bit boundaries of Wi-Fi? Exactly, that's a good question. So for every Wi-Fi packet, it has some format. We are using the envelope detector to detect the starting point of the Wi-Fi packet. As long as you know the bit rate used by the Wi-Fi, then you know the structure about the Wi-Fi you, you know the format of the Wi-Fi packet, and you know when should you inject your tag data. Does this answer your question? Uh, what is a typical code word in Wi-Fi? Is it like four microseconds for OFDM? Oh, so OFDM is another case. Um, let's uh, look at this particular example here, 11B, right? So for 11B, the uh, for one megabit per second Wi-Fi, one code word here is one microsecond. And for one mark base, there are only two code words. One detection would work with a resolution which is much better than one microsecond. That's all. Uh, our the preamble detection can detect at, uh, with error of the 300 nanoseconds. So one third of a code word. One third of code word. So how do you know? Like you don't know the exact code word, right? You know only one third of the code word. Yes, that's so what. what tell what when the code word really begins. Uh, exactly. There could be errors under. There could be the maximum errors you get is around thirty percent. And if you are, it actually depends on how far you are from the Wi-Fi transmitter. The closer you are from the Wi-Fi transmitter, the smaller the errors. The, lar the largest error our system can tolerate is thirty percent. There could be case where the error is larger than thirty percent, then our system fail to operate. How is it tolerating thirty percent error? Actually, I don't understand that. So your, the description you had was that you're taking one code word and somehow making it into code word Z, uh, code word uh, uh, J. Mm -hmm. But if you're off by 30% into the code word, mm -hmm. you're not going to You're using the 30%. Sorry. So thinking, thinking about the, uh, the code word we uh, uh, use here, right? So it's a Barker code, which has 11 uh, uh, components, right? 11 individual ch uh, chip. Mm -hmm. So you are able to uh, such uh, code word trend, uh, the decoding is able to tolerate the 30 percent of the errors in the Barker code. That's the reason. So what you're doing is not actually converting it into another valid code word. You're flipping eight of those bits. Sorry, it's, uh, there's only really two valid code words. There are only two valid code words, yeah. words in this but example. But you're not actually you're not actually going to another valid code word. You're just flipping it into another 
code word which yeah. basically yeah. Has, yeah. is the valid code word. Uh, the other valid code word is inverse of the first one. Oh. No, but they can't actually invert it into another valid code word. Uh, so the short answer here is that if let's think about the uh, ideal scenario where you don't have any timing errors. In this scenario, our system is able to convert one valid code word to another valid code word without any errors, right? In the ideal situation, and because of the presence of the because of the errors of the envelope detector, there could be thirty percent of the errors in the code word transformation. But according to our experience, for most for many of the uh, we tested the several of the uh, Wi-Fi receivers, they are able to tolerate up to thirty percent of the errors for de decoding the Barker code. So you're saying that the Barker code itself has some resilience for 30 years? Yeah, exactly. We are leveraging such re uh, redundancy of the, in the Barker code design to do the, uh, to do the, to uh, encode our information. Maybe it's some more clarifying questions mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm just a little confused. So uh, just probably picking up a little bit on Sean's question. So, uh, so if, if there is an error, which is, uh, so if, uh, let's say you're sending a, there's a packet which is transmitted with a transmitter, mm -hmm. and, you, and you did envelope detection for the entire packet. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the at, packet. At the beginning of the packet. Yeah. And let's say the packet has, you know, I forget, Wi-Fi is much larger packets. One millisecond, let's say. Mm -hmm. the, one millisecond. Uh, uh, packets. Oh, a packet is one millisecond. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so you're flipping the uh, code word for every packet, for every... Every for single. For every single in the packet. Yeah. Okay. And the... Uh, so the uh, and in some in some sense the uh, uh, the code word is long because it, it allows allows you for uh, you know uh, retrieving the data even if some of the some of the things are kind of corrupted. Yeah. And uh, you are taking advantage of that yeah. aspect. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but but uh, in some sense you uh, the the throughput of the tag. The throughput of the uh, throughput of the whatever the sensor in the middle uh, is uh, one bit per per, per Wi-Fi Wi symbol per, 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 per Wi-Fi code, Wi code word. Okay. But you were also saying you were shifting the code word as well. Oh, that, I will talk about that later. It's a slightly different question. So it's used for handle the interference. Yeah, that was one of the. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will cover that part later. So. Um, so the, I think the most important uh, thing here is that when you are doing the code word translation, you have to make sure the transformed code word is still a valid code word. Otherwise, as Chen mentioned, you cannot use a commercial Wi-Fi receiver to decode the reflected signal. So if you write down the logic of how the tag encodes its data, and you can see that if the tag transmitted data zero, it, the reflected signal here is exactly the same as the incoming Wi-Fi signal. If the tag transmits data 1 and the reflected code word here is modified and will be different compared to the signal that is generated by the Wi-Fi transmitter. When you write down the logic of this table here, you can figure out that the Wi-Fi, the backscatter, the reflected code word is the XOR between the tag data and the Wi-Fi code word. So decoding the tag data becomes much simpler. You only need two receivers, one receiving the backstack code word and one receiving on the Wi-Fi code word. Once you received the two code words here, then you can do the XOR to figure out what's the data that is produced by the tag. So, Having discussed about how the tag in, uh, encodes its own information, let's look at how practically, uh, in practical system, how the tag in, encodes uh, its information. In the previous example, we mentioned that the tag introduced some operation of multiplying minus one to encode its in information, right? So how does the tag introduce such operation at a low power? So let's think a bit more about what does my multiplying minus one mean for a wireless signal? It actually means that there is a 180 degrees phase change of the signal. 
if you are multiplying the signal by minus 1, that means that the reflected signal here has a 180 degrees phase difference compared to the signal that is produced by the Wi-Fi transmitter. So catching this point, then the question becomes, how could the tech introduce 180 degrees phase change at low power? One intuitive answer is that we can use the phase shifter. Phase shifter is a physical device that is able to produce a desired phase change. One drawback of using the phase shifter directly is that the power consumption of the phase shifter is high. For example, the phase shifter we listed here can seem 400 microwatts of power, and it's higher than our power budget, so we don't want to do that. So how could we introduce such phase change at low power? If you think about more carefully, 180 degrees phase change means there is a half cycle delay of the signal in the time domain. So as long as you are able to produce such time domain delay for the incoming signal, then you are able to introduce 180 degrees phase change. In our system, we built a 10 nanoseconds delay uh, which consume roughly around 1 microwatt of power for, de for introducing the 180 degrees phase change that is, that is needed by the uh, Cold War transformation. So um, the technology we just uh, described here, the Cold War transformation, we just said that it works with 11B Wi-Fi system, which is a legacy Wi-Fi system. But in fact, this technology can be extended and applied in many other wireless communication systems. And we show that it, it, we can inject the tag data on top of 11G Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and Zigbee. The reason behind it is that if you think about a wireless signal, there are three dimensions for you to encode the tag data, encode your information. One is amplitude, which is the red A here. One is the frequency, which is a blue F here, and one is a phase, which is a green theta here. So you can actually perform such code word transformation in three dimensions to encode the tag data. For example, you can change the amplitude of the reflected signal to encode your information. You can change the frequency of the reflected signal to encode your information. That's actually how we embed our information on top of the Bluetooth traffic. And you can also change the phase of the reflected signal to encode your information. So the technology we describe here can be extended to other scenarios and it's not only limited, it's not limited to Wi-Fi. Any questions here? All right. So uh, having discussed how we uh, uh, um, uh, encode the tag information on top of unknown Wi-Fi traffic, let's look at the, some of the practical uh, challenges that we face when implementing the system in a uh, wireless uh, with a commercial wireless transmitter. The there are several the when the wireless transmitter transmitting information, it does not directly transmit the zero and the one. Instead of transmitting the data, the data has to be passed through several modules before sending the data out. For example, we are passing the data through scrambler interleaving. And these modules create some operations on the reflected signal. And these modules can uh, disturb how the tag encodes its information. And we have to handle that in order to decode the tag data. Let's look at the first uh, module here, the scrambler. Let's look at the scrambler. Uh, uh, are you going to go back and talk about how uh, what are the issues with an envelope detection, and uh, what's the? Uh, it seems like you'll have to make an escape machine mm -hmm. on the on the on the on the tag side, on the tag side. Mm -hmm. and uh, there's some potentially costs involved with it. Energy, uh, energy, and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, are you going to talk about that, or I mean, or you, do you want to say a few words about it? Uh, so I think so. Uh, basically, the uh, we are running a very simple state machine. The state machine has two states. One is that detecting the uh, preamble and the header part of the Wi-Fi packet. Uh, this is done by, uh, this, this state is triggered by the uh, 
uh, envelope detector, which detects the starting point of the Wi-Fi packet. And the, the reason why you don't want, you want to make sure that you, are, you want to detect a, a header and preamble uh, of the Wi-Fi packet is that you don't want to modify this part at all. If you modify this part, then uh, the, com the commercial Wi-Fi receiver cannot decode the packets correctly. And the second state here is data injection, where you inject the data only on the payload of the Wi-Fi packet. So once you detect the starting point of the, uh, once you finish it, the detecting the preamble and header, after some Gottman, after the header, then you start injecting the uh, uh, tag data. So the last part here is that um, uh, for any Wi-Fi packet, we have the CRC check, right? Uh, because we are injecting data on top of the unknown Wi-Fi traffic, we don't know the content of the payload of the Wi-Fi traffic, so we cannot guarantee the CRC check of the Wi-Fi packet is valid. Actually, in most of the cases, or in almost all the cases, the CRC check is wrong. So uh, um, basically, if the system pass the corrupted packets to the application, then you are able to extract the, uh, all the tech information. If the packets was uh, dropped by the NIC on the, on the hardware level, then you cannot grab any tech information. So, uh, so essentially, you have to skip past just the, uh, just the Ethernet header part of the Wi-Fi yep. wi packet. Yep. And, and you will modify everything else. Modify everything else. Okay. UDB yeah. or TCP yeah. headers. And payload things. is up to you. Okay. Up to your uh, uh, I mean, the payload includes kind of all of those other headers. Oh, uh, no, we don't no, modify no. the header. Sorry? We don't modify the header. We just modify the data payload. We don't modify the Ethernet uh, pay, uh, header. No, 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 no. Yeah, I, I understand that you don't modify the Ethernet header, but there are subsequent uh, protocol headers. Which, ah. um, uh, those are those are getting modified. Uh, <laughs> no, we we actually we didn't modify that part either because the, the this part is that uh, we that's actually a good question. I I'm not sure whether you can modify that part. Uh, when we design the system, we are thinking about just modify the data payload without any modifying even the uh, protocol uh, uh, header. This part. So. I'm trying to understand well, this. How well, I mean, this if you're not modifying the header, then how do you know where the header boundary and data boundary are? You know the protocol, right? For example, for the one. Well, if it's Ethernet, then I know. But I mean, if, unless you're embedding in like information about which TCP or IP or. Ah. IP ah, I, I see. I, I see your point. So we. We um, we make some uh, I think the, our system makes some assumptions that you have some information that is about the transmitter about what kind of protocol the transmitter is using. Once, for example, once you select the transmitter at one megabits per second, eleven B Wi-Fi transmitter, you know the protocol that it's using. The thing I'm confused about is the following: which is this thing works if you have a single transmitter or receiver, and you know the protocol of the transmitter. Yep. But if you take a typical Wi-Fi network like what we have here, <coughs> you can have to point eleven B, you can have G, you can have N. Yeah. And sitting there, the tag actually doesn't know which protocol it's using, yeah. which means it can't even know what is the preamble, what is the payload. Nothing can be known mm -hmm. because it's a low power tag. It can't decode a Wi-Fi packet. <coughs> yeah. So how does it actually work in a general Wi-Fi network? Um, this is a, we have not addressed this problem. So I think the sham the uh, is an open uh, question in, uh, right now. So the question is basically how the tag distinguished identify the income the the style of the incoming Wi-Fi traffic, right? What's the what's the bit rate, and whether it's running 11B mode or 11G mode, and even within the same mode, what's the corresponding bit rate, right? Because for each bit rate, you are going to run a slightly different uh, code word transformation. So for the short answer is that it's an open question. We have not addressed that, and what we did here is that we. Are, for example, for the Wi-Fi transmitter, we are installing some dedicated app, which is under your control. Even you can use the app to browse the internet, whatever, but you are still using the dedicated uh, wireless communication uh, protocol that you define in the app. You can choose different one. For example, you, you can choose 11B, 11G. You can choose six megabits per second or one megabit per second, but you have to let the tech know uh, which protocol you are using. Uh, one potential idea that we are thinking about is that is it possible to leverage the temporal time domain patterns of uh, of the system and do some of the uh, correlation using some of the uh, analog circuits on the tech side in a low power fashion to identify which protocol you are running? But it's still uh, uh, just one idea, but we don't know the answer. 
Yeah, no, if you can figure out classified protocols, yeah, without in some such a low power you device, low power fashion. without having to, without even being able to decode them. Exactly. The information you want to know is that you don't want to know the specific data in the header or in the payload. You just want to identify basic classification. Right? You want to identify which protocol is running, but it's a open question. We don't have answer. Also control the application that's running on yeah. the transmitters. Yeah. So if you make them just send raw IP packets, then you also know what are, what are the IP, IP packet header size. Yeah. Right yeah. after the Ethernet packet yeah. header size. So yeah. in that case, if you control the applications, you actually control how long the packet header. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the only question is that you're doing this for any arbitrary packet. Uh, just makes yeah. Sense. yeah. So, so, so I mean, like you could right. one question that I had is that suppose if you but to say there's a destination MAC address, a specification, a specific destination MAC address mm -hmm. that you match on for these RFID tags, mm -hmm. and those are the only ones that you reflect or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the feasibility of doing that kind of a check? And uh, uh, whether, whether that's, uh, you know. We don't know right now because I think so. You probably want to, uh, the, the, the most challenging part here is that you want to do such detection in a low power fashion. Yeah. So you don't want to decode the Wi-Fi packet, check each bit, right? So you want to basically do such comparison in an analog domain. So probably... The problem with backscatter things is that you can't decode phase on them. All you can do is amplitude. Yeah. And almost everything in Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or anything is actually phase. So you can't actually decode those things on a low power device. So uh, I think the most challenge here is that for if you are only want to leverage the Wi-Fi uh, MAC address, and the amount of the information or the amount of known data bits in an analog domain might not be might be too short for you to perform the co uh, effective correlation, you mm -hmm. might want to know a bit more to perform effective correlation to identify which protocol you are running. That's just my guess. In addition, the packets are pretty fixed size. Uh, not necessary. In the sense that, uh, uh, for example, uh, we, we have an envelope detector which is able to detect when the Wi-Fi packet starts and when the Wi-Fi packet stops. Yeah, I was, I was worried about what happened to the uh, Ethernet CRC at the end ah. of the packet. Ah. If you didn't know, then you were going yeah, to... Yeah, you actually sense. need to know the packet, right? Because we know the packets. Because no, no, you need to know the packet size, as Tom mentioned, because if you didn't know that if you're backscattering, you have to stop in the middle of the transmission of whatever you're trying to, or whatever payload of backscatter you're trying to do, uh -huh. you have to stop in the middle. Yes. So, uh, but it's actually, uh, in our system, we are using a slightly different design. So we are actually uh, using the, uh, we, we do not assume the length of the packets, but we know when the packet stop. And then we know that several bits might be corrupted. So in the next packet, we will retransmit this part. <laughs> So we, we are we, we don't uh, we, we don't because the the problem is that the knowing the length of the packets the hardware of like the receiver hardware would throw away the packet because the CRC was no corrupted it's uh, it's up to the hardware uh, for we tried the Broadcom and the Qualcomm chips and some chips works and some chips does not work yeah all right so let's move to the second part here. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. That's what we had in the Stanford Net seminar. So, <laughs> uh, so as we mentioned here, right, there are uh, additional modules like the scrambler in the lever, which does some processing on the data before you trans the, before you feed the data directly to the transmitter. So let's look at the impact of these modules here. First one, let's look at the scrambler that is used by the 11B Wi-Fi system. So for the scrambler. The purpose of the scrambler is to make sure the data that is transmitted by the radio is not all zeros, even though the input packet might be all zeros. The reason why we want to have such scrambler is that we want to make uh, we want to um, an improved energy efficiency of the radio. If the data that is transmitted by the radio is all zeros, the energy efficiency of the radio is really low. So that's why we need a scrambler. But Scrambler creates some problems. Let's look at the Scrambler that is used by the 11B system. And this one shows the architecture of the uh, structure of the 11B Scrambler. The output of the Scrambler is YN here, and the input of the Scrambler is XN here. And you can see that the output of the Scrambler is produced 
by XORing the input signal and a delayed version of the output signal. So it's X N X O Y N minus four X O N minus seven. That's the signal produced by the scrambler. And the discrambler, this is the structure of the discrambler used by the receiver. And if you walk through the structure of this discrambler, you can see that the discrambler reverses the operation of the scrambler. So the output of the discrambler here is exactly the same as the input data packets. This system works really well if we don't have the tag in the picture. When the tag is present, we have a tag here, right? The input of the tag is the output of the scrambler. And then the input of the discrambler is no longer YM. Because the tag encodes some information on the reflected signal. The input of the discrambler here becomes Y star N. So if you write down this formulation, and you can figure out that the output of the scrambler in addition to the contribution from the original Wi-Fi packet XN here, you can see the contribution of the tag information plus several previous tag data. So the red portion here, this part here, if you look at this part more carefully, you can figure out this part, the red portion here, is produced by the structure of the discrambler. So the insight here is that when you decode the tag data, you cannot directly get the tag data here when you decode the Wi-Fi packets. Because these packets, the tag information, is scrambled by a discrambler. As a result, when you want to decode the tag data, we know that the scrambler and discrambler are reversible architecture. Then, when you decode the tag information here, you just feed the tag information back to the scrambler, and output of the scrambler will be your tag information. The second module here is. Can you back up one slide for a second? So, where you, where you wrote y star of n equals y of n plus tag of n, is that an addition like. Uh, X or. It's X or. Yeah. So, that happens. Well, how does, how does that happen? So, uh, when the tag encode its information, if the tag transmitted a zero, then the reflected signal will be same as the incoming Wi-Fi signal. If the tag data is one, then the reflected signal will be different compared to the incoming Wi-Fi signal. So this operation here is XOR, it's not plus. That's the reason why uh, it's compatible with the operation that is used by the scrambler. Right, so um, let's move to the next module here, which is the interleaving. So interleaving um, is not wide, it's not uh, uh, used for the 11B Wi-Fi, but it's used for the 11G OFDM Wi-Fi system. So in the interleaving system, um, it takes incoming signal sequence, let's say X N here, and randomize the sequence in a particular order, produce this sequence here. You can see that the sequence that is produced by the interleaving module is a randomized version compared to the incoming bit sequence here. The reason why we want to have the interleaving module here is that we want to avoid the bursty arrows. We want to minimize the uh, contributions from the bursty arrows on the wireless channel to avoid the continuous data loss. So uh, we have the interleaving module here. and. The D interleaving module at the receiver reverse the operation produced by the interleaver. And we can see that the output of the D interleaving module here is exactly the same as the data input of the, uh, of, uh, of the Wi-Fi transmitter. When the tag is present, the story becomes a bit more complicated because the input of the interleaving module is also modified by the tag. Let's take this example here. Let's see that the tag wants to transmit some information, 101010. And we can see that we know that the, the input of the D interleaving module here, Y star N here, 
is modified by the tag by performing some operation. So let's write down the operations that is produced by the tag. The tag, since the first bit, the tag transmit is one, then the first bit here is modified by the tag, the BN here, which is a blue here. It's a bit of vague here. And the third bit is also modified by the tag here. But the second bit and the fourth bit is not modified by the tag because the tag data here is zero and the fourth bit is also zero. If we fit this modified data into the D interleaving module, we can find that the output of the D interleaving module is no longer the XOR between the tag data and the Wi-Fi transmitter, transmitter data. You can see that the first bit is not modified by the tag because the D interleaving module reshuffle the sequence. So how do we handle this problem? Our key observation here is that for the OFDM Wi-Fi system, the D interleaving or the interleaving is done on the OFDM symbol level. That means that when you are interleaving the bit sequence, you are interleaving the bits within one OFDM symbol. You never interleave the bits across two OFDM symbols. That's the key of the vision we found here. As a result, when the tag transmitted to zero, the reflected OFDM symbol is exactly the same as a Wi-Fi transmitter OFDM signal. However, when the tag modify when the tag wants to transmit the one, it modifies all the bits within the OFDM symbol. Then decoding the tag data, we only need to check whether the OFDM symbol is modified by the tag or not to decode the information the tag injected. So how do you how do you modify the code words for OFDM? OFDM, right? Yeah. So OFDM, the you can you, uh, we don't figure out a solution to modify the information for every bit. We modify the face of the OFDM symbol, the whole symbol. And once you modify the face of the home symbol, every bit within the OFDM symbol is flipped. And uh, the reason why you can modify the face of the OFDM symbol is also uh, uh, interesting in the sense that you know that uh, for one OFDM symbol, it has for pilot that is used for correcting the errors of the phase, right? So, but for many of the receivers, commercial receivers, not the USRP based receivers, they are not using the uh, uh, pilot for correcting the phase errors at all. They are not using that. They are just relying on the uh, preamble for correcting the frequency errors. That's the reason why when you are modifying the phase of, of, the, of the OFDM symbol, the phase modification introduced by the tag is still maintained when the receiver receives the OFDM symbol because it does not use the uh, um, uh, pilot to correct the operations that is produced by the tag. All right. So uh, the last challenge that we addressed in building the system is that how could we provide a spectrum efficient data injection? So if you are thinking about our system, which reflect the signal from the transmitter to the receiver, the receiver received the reflected signal, but at the same time, the receiver also received the signal from the Wi-Fi transmitter. And usually, the signal from the Wi-Fi transmitter is much louder compared to the signal that is reflected by the tag. As a result, decoding the tag information is really hard because of the interference that is produced by the Wi-Fi transmitter. So if you think a bit more about why the interference is so big from the Wi-Fi transmitter, the reason is that the reflected signal here shares the same Wi-Fi channel as the Wi-Fi transmitter signal. And usually, the reflected signal is much weak, uh, weaker compared to the Wi-Fi signal. As a result, decoding the backstory signal here is really hard. So one of the ideas we have here is that we found that the backstory signal here, the reflected signal here, is the superposition between the local signal that is produced by the tag 
and the Wi-Fi transmitter signal. As a result, as you increase the frequency of the local text signal here, you are able to move the reflected signal to another Wi-Fi channel. As long as the back series signal here share is sitting on different channel compared to the Wi-Fi transmitter signal, the interference from the Wi-Fi transmitter will be much smaller. However, when you perform such operations, in addition to creating the desired signal on the right side here, we also create an undesired signal on the left side, which is called double side bank backsetter. And this undesired signal on the left side creates interference for other Wi-Fi signals. And it also uh, reduces the e uh, efficiency of using the spectrum. So the question we want to ans ask here is that, is it possible for us to create, to eliminate the undesired signal on the left part. To do that, we built a system that uses analog components to cancel the signal on the left part. We take the incoming signal, split the signal into two parts. On the first part, the signal is exactly the same as the incoming Wi-Fi signal. On the second part, we play some trick. We make the left part of the signal reversed, but the right part of the signal remain the same. Then we add them together. The left part cancel with each other. The right part remains the same. Then we are able to create the desired signal here. All right. So we uh, built the hardware and the software prototype of our system, and this is the. Uh, a picture of the ready board that we built. And this ready board can be used for supporting different kinds of applications. And we built one of the applications we built is for uh, uh, image sensing uh, system that is shown here. And we open source our software and hardware on the GitHub. And we also use this system for teaching the undergrad course in Stanford for EU 107 network system. And this is one of the video uh, that the students uh, captured in our uh, course. Uh, you can see the black bars, black strips here are uh, produced because of the packet loss in backscatter. Um, so let's talk a bit more about the performance of our system. Uh, we evaluate our system in a hallway. We have a Wi-Fi transmitter, a tag, and the Wi-Fi receiver. The Wi-Fi receiver is my laptop. And we move the receiver across distance and measure how much throughput can you get. And uh, we, for when the Wi-Fi transmitter transmits at 15 dBm, we are able to get roughly 300 kilobits per second data rate at close distance. And the maximum distance between the tech and the laptop, which is the receiver, is 42 meters. The distance between the Wi-Fi transmitter and tech is one meter. If we increase the Wi-Fi transmission power to 30 dBm, which is the maximum allowed by FCC, we are able to operate at a distance of 50 meters. The, then we conduct experiments where when the Wi-Fi transmitter and tag is put in one room and we move the Wi-Fi receiver in a hallway, at, we measure the distance across, uh, measure the throughput across distance, and we can see that the maximal distance in such non-line of sight scenario is roughly 10 meters shorter compared to the previous experiments. Now, uh, let's move to the second part of my talk where we want to discuss briefly about how could we build energy efficient computing system for energy harvesting devices. Uh, the key question we want to answer here is that how could we support software and hardware task execution on energy harvesting devices. Uh, ma many uh, researchers and industry are thinking about leveraging harvesting for providing additional power uh, to enable continuous operation. There are roughly two types of energy harvesting system. One is a macro energy harvesting system and one is a micro energy harvesting system. Harvesting system. So for the macro uh, energy harvesting system, like the solar farm, the, uh, they usually have a very big energy buffer, and the charging and discharging cycle is really long. It's on the order of several days or weeks. Compared to that, for the micro energy harvesting system, we leveraged micro energy harvester for providing a limited amount of power for IoT device. 
And usually the NH buffer is very small, and the charging discharging cycle is on the order on the order of milliseconds. So the challenge for running software and hardware tasks on such system is that it's really hard to uh, it, it's really hard to predict the how much energy is available in a tiny amount of the uh, buffer in uh, in a single discharging cycle. So one example of such system is the uh, RFID-ish communication system. We measure one of the network stack that is called Dewdrop, uh, and try to understand how far can it operate across distance. And we found that when you run the network stack, uh, the Dewdrop, it the system stops operation after 1.2 meters. So we were thinking about why the distance is short, what's the limiting factor. The answer is there are potentially two possible limiting factors, right? One is the wireless communication. I cannot operate further because I don't have sufficient wireless communication link. The other is energy harvesting. I don't have enough energy to operate. So to verify which one is a, core, a limiting factor, we power the device with a battery. Then we found that the device is actually con continuous around the network at a distance 6.6 .6 meters. There is a large gap between the two scenarios, right? So, which means that the limiting, the short range of the system is caused by the factor of the energy harvesting. So let's dive into the energy harvesting demand and try to understand what's limiting the range. So um, we found that the uh, we tested several network stack here, and I, we found that the key limiting factor here is that we cannot uh, execute the uh, task in a network stack in a single discharging cycle. And for example, if you look at the EPC Gen 2 network stack, one of the network stack that is used by the uh, Wi-Fi system, uh, used by the RFID uh, system, this in order to transmit the red packets here, you have to put, do sub, you have to transmit several handshake message between the tag and the reader. If any of the packets in the middle fails due to energy outage, the task execution fails. So the key observation we found here is that we found that the atomic units in this in this system is too large and it cannot fit into a single discharging cycle. So how to handle this problem? So the answer is fairly simple, right? If the size of the task, atomic task, is too large, let's say make it very small. For example, for the communication task, instead of transmitting a whole packet, we can transmit several bits, right? But if you do it in this way, you do minimize the energy outage rate, but you also sacrifice the task execution rate. The rate, the efficiency of running such tasks becomes much lower. So our system here is able to tune two factors. One is how much time that you sleep, and one is how much task you run in a single discharging cycle to maximize the task execution rate while minimizing the energy outage rate. And due to the, the time constraints, I will not cover all the details here. So. Um, Let's see. So, uh, if you uh, our key observation here is that we are um, tuning to fact two parameters here: how much time you sleep and how much task you run uh, on the, di during the discharging cycle. If you optimize these two parameters, we can actually run uh, image sensing task with a three centimeter by three centimeter solar panel in uh, indoor light conditions. The key insight here is that we take the image sensing task here, you want to capture this image, but don't capture the whole image in one shot. You can capture the image pixel by pixel so we, are, we inserted the sleep time between pixels. In addition to that, we also did, uh, did, uh, fragment the pixel sampling operation. 
we fragment it into two parts such that we are able to insert sleep time between each operations here. Then our system, by fragmenting, by, minimi by uh, uh, reducing the amount of tasks you run in a single discharging cycle, you are able to run the image sensing task when the system is only have a limited amount of power available. Thanks. I'm happy to take questions. So how long does capturing that image take then if you're inserting a bunch of sleeps in the middle? Uh, it depends on energy having to read because that will decide uh, determines your how much time you sleep. Uh, usually, it takes several minutes to sample a whole picture. What, like what happens if people are moving and like motion blur? Then you are you are introducing motion blur. What if the actual device, the camera itself, is moving? Uh, it's also motion blur. So the picture you get will be will not be perfect as this. So you are you will see uh, pic pixels are stretched out. We do not have a solution for this problem right now. If you are running the, you are uh, running the system uh, in this way. And so my question is that what is the maximum frame rate that you can get with this structure? With, with this structure, structure, right? Yeah. So um, the overhead, so I think the question can be translated into the how much overhead is introduced when you are trans doing transition between the sleep and the active mode, right? Because if you get sufficient energy, then the sleep time can be zero. So you can perform, let's say, 10 frames per second, this kind of stuff. But if you are, so it's basically limited by the, the transition overhead. So, well, normal scenarios, as uh, he, he asked, we are getting uh, several minutes per picture. So have you actually tried to do this kind of, uh, you talked about, for example, the previous thing you talked about networking operations. Yeah. Has anyone had to do that for the OS in particular? Like if you want to schedule multiple tasks and stuff and if you're having a harvesting device, is there anyone who has done that? Uh, not idea? yet. Not yet. Because um, what we tried is that we are doing the optimization for one type of the task. For example, here, we're optimizing for the sensing task or in the previous case, we are optimizing for the communication task. But there is no scheduler or in general operating system that schedule multiple types of tasks in a combination. No, nobody has done that before. Oh, we, we have done that. We have not done that yet either. Um, so what are the tasks that went into you? How, when do you insert the states? Yeah. Like, um, is it about how do you save the internal states and stuff like that? What are the things that right. you when you were trying to hand tune when do you start this state? Uh, I, I think so the your question is that where do you st uh, store the state? How do you figure out when to insert the state, basically? How to insert? Automate that in that state. Um, I think so. Uh, basically, um, it's, um, it's what kind of information provides, what, what kind of additional information do you have to make a decision about, I should sleep now, right? So the question here is that we are using a threshold comparator. So basically, you are continuously monitoring the uh, voltage that is available on the energy buffer. If the energy is lower than the threshold, then you are converting into the sleep state. And this threshold is dynamically adjusted based on the energy harvesting rate. So, so I wanted to say something. That maybe Tom or Alvin can correct me, but maybe back in the day, like before general purpose computers came, <laughs> I don't know if you said that. Because I don't need this tree. It's the only person in the world. I've noticed it's like designing things with specific applications. Uh, and something happened. I'm assuming it's operating system, uh, which allowed for general purpose operation of multiple applications at the same time. I wonder what it would take for. I think what how I see the battery free designs right now. All the states is basically everyone is optimizing it for specific applications. Camera, yeah. you get the. If you want a microphone, you get this. Yeah. If you want a speaker, you get this. There is no general framework where people can just. And that's not going to scale. You want to basically. Uh, I mean, that has to be done. Mm -hmm. We are doing that. You guys are doing that. But what we need is basically this general purpose thing, which can potentially, hopefully, generalize like an OS for general purpose OS. Well, I think. I think. Uh, couple things here. So the first is uh, like a history of where multi programming came from. It was primarily the, that computers were expensive. And so multi programming was a way of getting 
higher duty signals for this expensive bit of hardware that you have. And that's not really the case that you have here. Like what you're after is the kind of platforms of story of being able to have multiple applications and multiple people writing code for some common set of infrastructure. Uh, so that you don't have to deploy as many sensors as you would if you were doing I think the second thing that, that I would say that makes that more difficult is that there is a bunch of work on kind of the scheduling, how to do real-time scheduling under constraints. Um, so what is, how do you do your operating systems or how do you do scheduling, given that you have a certain number of tasks to do that you know about in advance, uh, will you actually be able to always accomplish the goals that you have for whatever, but if you're flying a spacecraft or something like that. Um, and there's a bunch of research about this, but basically you're having to analyze the entire program. Like, not just the one program, but also all the things that run on a particular system in order to be able to know whether or not you can meet uh, the deadlines of a particular system. Uh, that is, it's not, oh, just look at it individually, but rather uh, essentially analyzing the behavior of the total system as a whole. And uh, so that's essentially the state of the art for doing all the programs. So is, it, is, it, is, it, is it the case that if you don't care about real-time constraints, if you can make them fault tolerant, like if you just have a task queue and every task can be rerun, right. if, then if, it's actually a solve. If you're not trying to make it real-time, then I think it, 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 it's a solve problem. Yeah, then I think you're, you're, you would be, it would be easier to do. Like if you're not having to give the answer in a, in a defined amount of time. The, I think the difficulty with, with doing anything in a defined amount of time is, well, like there's interactions of, you know, what happens if somebody holds a lock? Well, they're gonna, you know how long they're gonna hold the lock for, so that's gonna delay somebody else who needs to get access to something. I mean, there's a set of other things that are gonna happen to them. I, I think the limiting factor, the, uh, the challenge factor here, there are uh, two, two kinds of constraints. It comes from the, uh, some of the protocol constraints such as, such as timing. And the other is the comes from the energy constraints. The risk here is not low power. The, uh, the risk here is that you might lose all the state because of the energy outage. So that's a hard part. Yeah, we were talking about NDN <coughs> actually over lunch. And uh, it potentially gives you this opportunity or, or some kind of low power storage device. Mm -hmm. Like today, flat, you're kind of storing back and flat. You're, you're deciding, OK, do I have enough time to be able to do the next operation where I have to store or whatever? my current state of the world is to Flash so that I can bring it back in the next time I have power. Flash is really uh, actually very um, expensive uh, operations. Yeah. So you really people, app yeah, RAM, app RAM is much a, a better. Inexpensive RAM, yeah. you know, uh, persistent storage device would potentially give you uh, more flexibility with mm -hmm. respect to how long, you, uh, how long in advance you have to. It's cheap to store in the RAM, uh, it, especially in the embedded system, the RAM size is very small, but it's also a bit risky, you might lose all the state. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much.